The second sitting of the House of Assembly took place yesterday with the budget as the main agenda in its first reading with a dissatisfied opposition calling it the worst budget ever seen. Honourable Premier Talangi presented the first reading of the budget saying it is aimed at development and investment. The 50 million appropriation budget for 2011 to 2012 emphasised two proposals highlighted by Premier Talangi to create and support more revenue options and opportunities, more jobs, more business opportunities, more social support to ensure that everyone is gainfully employed. Secondly, to continue to collect revenues and to ensure that it's also looking at generating revenue and not to rely on donors only. With other countries facing economic difficulties, Honourable Premier wanted the island to be prepared if there are shortfalls in assistance. Premier Talangi called for the House to take into account the number one resource, the people, and financial ability to to remunerate workers. However, the opposition thinks the outlook is bleak with no changes to the cost of living adjustment and other areas that need change for community development like that of roads and so on. Premier Talangi justified the submission comparing it to building a house. How you fund a house, sometimes you have to sacrifice some things for others. The key is to make sure you have a roof over your head at least and the family is taken care of. The second reading of the budget will take place next month with a proposed three-day meeting to conclude the budget. Other issues brought forward yesterday is the distribution of roles within government committees. The three main committees, the Bills, House and Public Expenditures. In the Bills Committee, Honourable Bokotoa Sipeli, Honourable Billy Talangi, Honourable Kupa Mangatongia, Tamako Tonga, Member of Parliament Peter Ilfunaki, and Commonwealth Member Crossy Tatui, and Member of Parliament Honourable Bill Motufo. The House Committee Honourable Joan Vidiamu, Member of Parliament for Makefu, Taulele Hema Ama Tongia, Member for Baya Talisi Tama Talisi, Honourable Tongia Sian Holo, Member for Alofi North Vainga Tukitonga. Member for Hakupu, Honourable Young Vivian, and Member for Tuapa, Honourable Fisa Pihingia. The Public Expenditures Committee, Honourable Terry Ko, the new Assistant Minister, Honourable Dalton Tangilangi, Member for Namukulu, Jack Willie Lipitoa, new Assistant Minister, Honourable Billy Talangi, Commonwealth Member Crossley Tatui, Commonwealth Member Stanley Kalawili, and Honourable Fisa Pihingia. There are two other working committees the CPA and the Constitution Review Committee. One other issue debated in the House yesterday is the new government's decision to have six ministers in cabinet. This was quickly brought forward by the opposition, calling on Premier Talangi to relook at the new roles which are not included in the minister's civil list 2009. However, a member can be appointed as an assisting minister to the Premier. The civil list will no doubt be looked at if any change to the new role and the remuneration for the two assisting ministers. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, is the international agreement that defines the rights and responsibilities of nations in the use of world oceans, establishing guidelines for business, the environment and the management of maritime natural resources. The convention entered into force in November of 1994. All Pacific Island countries are signatories of the convention and thus share common obligations under it. This week, two consultants, one from SOPAC and the Attorney General's Department of the Australian Government, are here to discuss with stakeholders the requirements of newest part in the convention. Emily Attak from SOPAC said Niue has also the same obligations as other signatories to the United Nations Conventions on the Law of the Sea. Under that convention, uh, Niue is entitled to four maritime zones, so uh, the 12 nautical miles from the baseline, 
uh, the territorial sea we call it and the contiguous zone which is 24 nautical miles and the common one which everybody knows is the exclusive economic zones around Niue. So at the moment Niue has a treaty with American Samoa to the north but uh, is yet to negotiate uh, the treaties with Tonga and with the Cook Islands. So that's why we are here to assist the technical people, the representatives from the Lands Justice Department, as well as the Crown Law. Uh, so we also assisting in terms of updating the legislation which deals with uh, maritime zones for Niue. Niue has, has uh, completed the technical data. In fact, this was done in 2005. Mm -hmm. And now we just need to uh, amend your legislation to incorporate the, 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 that technical data into um, what you currently recognize in your legislation. How difficult is it for you as to work with Niue in determining some of these processes that you go through just to get, you know, like the treaty, to get agreement from perhaps our closest neighbours, Tonga and, and someone else? Uh, well, we've been working with various departments here in, in UA and it's important that all, all the departments work together because, as you said, it's you know, there are complex issues and there's it's a combination of technical issues, legal issues, diplomatic issues, so it's important that, uh, that all those stakeholders work together on this matter. Have you had any issues that's been brought up because, you know, because some of the issues that uh, we have here in the Pacific, like Niue, we don't have the resources to mm. monitor our own zone? Yes, that's true. Um, uh, for, from our project, uh, we basically try to um, calculate the zones and then once countries have that in their national legislation and also deposit with the United Nations, which is the ultimate goal of this, then uh, people will know where the zones are and uh, vessels that do come past into the zones will know that they are crossing into newer zones. Uh, in terms of from your own surveillance, uh, from the country's per perspective, um, it will be a challenge for new uh, to and for the other countries as well to actually su uh, survey some of the the zones. I, I know some countries do offer navy vessels that do come and try to uh, um, go around the zones for the countries, but uh, it yeah, I think that will. Uh, be something that the government will uh, implement is uh, actually surveillance uh, mm. over the EZs. Yes. Niwe has yet to negotiate the treaty with other neighbouring islands such as Tonga and the Cook Islands. The Environment Department is pleased with the announcement that AusAid will be contributing $500,000 towards Niwe's Pacific Adaptation to Climate Change Project. Following consultations with communities, it was identified that one focal area for Niue would be in the area of water resources, and a proposal was developed for a project to install water tanks in every household on the island. At that time, funds were sourced from the Global Environment Facility. However, it was insufficient to cover the whole project. The news of this latest contribution from AusAid is a major boost to the project that has been a joint effort between the Water Division and the Environment Department. The Environment Director Sawini Tongatuli says the focus now is to identify how to proceed forward with the tendering process for the construction of the tanks underway. He says it is hoped that it can be done locally to avoid high costs of freight and additional costs associated with shipping in from overseas. The proposed water tanks will have a capacity of 10,000 litres and other plans to seek further funding into sourcing solar-powered water pumps is being explored. Environment Department says that by the beginning of next year, the island can expect to see the implementation of this project and the Pacific Adaptation Climate Change Project is supported by UNDP and SPREAD. The CCSGP is a community-centred initiative that enables community members to organise for collective action by pooling resources and building solidarity towards resolving common problems and achieving a shared vision for community advancement. Tuapa Village and Hakupu were the two villages identified to implement the pilot initiative from UNDP. Tuapa's renewable energy focus has one expert 
of the subject arrive on the island for a feasibility study on what is more practical and beneficial for the village. Tere Kino Wairaka from the Cook Island said the renewable plan should be in par with community resources and capabilities. We're looking at wind energy, uh, solar farm, also solar for e individual houses. And then at present, based on my assessments of the limited information I have on hand, um, grid tie system appears to be the most favorable and attractive option for them. Grid tie systems offers a system where it utilizes the existing grid for Tuapa. And um, because in that nature, Tuapa as a community also has all the houses being supplied on the grid, it is only wise that grid tie system is the best option other than any other options. Although the other options could be the solar farm, considering the cost, the support required, the maintenance, in my opinion, to date, grid tower systems appears to be the best and viable option for them. It will be a sustainable system. The reason being is it's on the grid. A standalone system will not be ever be considered for Tuapa. The reason being is Tuapa at present they also are all connected onto the grid. They have electricity to all the community there. So a standalone system will only applies to an installation or in a household where there is no grid, there is no power. In uh, Tuapa's case, most likely at this stage, the most options I will be looking once again will be the grid tire system or the farm. And of course, looking at the options and uh, the pros and cons of both systems to see which one is more viable. Is that going to be much, much more expensive than just having um just having the system that uh, the grid tie system that uh, you were talking about individually? Yes, certainly it will be a, a much, much cheaper, uh, less capital costs involved in for grid tie system than a, a farm system. A farm system has, uh, I have explained uh, to the committee chairperson and also to the committee of Tuapa, a grid a farm system you can establish that and the only best way to, to utilize this is to connect them to the grid. Now, however, for their purpose, you cannot connect them to the grid. That is the people of New World will benefit, not the people of Tuapa, which defeats, defeats the purpose for Tuapa. So in this case, a farm must be connected to, for Tuapa community only. In that case, it's they need to run individual wise, which is fairly an expensive exercise to, to do. So grid tire system, once again, is an attractive option for them. How important is it, do you think, for us here in Niue as a whole to look at renewable energy as an option? Yes, definitely is that. There's two or three several uh, benefits you will, you will look at the system. One of them for individual customer, he will have a cheaper power bill to pay. That if you have a cheaper power bill, the utility will be using less fuels to supply uh, that particular customer. Less fuels means for the utility means less um, diesel has been used, less diesel has been used, it's less uh, gas emission being uh, produced from the general. So all in all, in that, when you're doing that, it's actually co newest contributing to the global um, gas emission reduction, although it's a minimum, at least it's been seen from the Pacific Tiny, new way it's contributing towards minimizing gas emission. Recommendations of what will benefit Tuapa Assessing the island's environment is a factor that most experts must consider when drafting systems. Solar energy, biofuel, hydro dams, wind and grid tie systems were some of the topics discussed by Mr. Vaireka, informing the Tuapa community that a solar system must be able to address the needs of the community and bring benefits and sustainability. High maintenance system, says Mr. Vaireka, is expensive and impractical, and he is hoping by the end of his feasibility study of some of the island's current solar initiatives, a proposal of his recommendations will be considered by the community. There are rising concerns for health and well-being of communities affected by non-communicable diseases that are easily preventable with better nutrition and physical activity. This week, a health dietitian from New Zealand has been working with the Public Health Division of the New York Full Hospital to assess the nutritional value and contributing factors faced by New Wayans in relation to NCDs. She says that being on the island, 
gives a better picture of the challenges faced by Nguyen people and it is a learning opportunity to increase cultural competencies. So I wanted to learn a little bit about the culture and to upskill my yeah, cultural competencies and to, um, to actually challenge myself with a limited food supply and having to uh, apply the guidelines and, and education around a quite a restricted food supply. This week has been spent visiting communities, educating and discussing some issues of concerns contributing to these diseases. The main concerns should be around food security. Uh, you've got an inconsistent food supply and it's almost sort of a bit like for a hunter-gatherer farming um, sort of uh, culture which is then supplied by stuff from New Zealand but you're very <coughs> reliant on what's on the boat and um, the availability from season to season and also the expense. So it's very much, um, it's not, uh, food security is an issue here. Also the, um, the cultural belief about eating big uh, and I think I'm, I'm sort of trying to get people to challenge that culture a little bit because Food is a lot more available than in the past, and I think that this, that culture of um, excessive intake is what's contributing to these diseases. And I'm also surprised about the lack of fluid that most people drink, um, and I wonder if that might also be contributing where people think they are hungry when actually they might be thirsty. So those are three areas that I've worked on with people. Based on, I guess, some of the consultations that you've had this week and how the health department, the people, and possibly talking to government uh, would assist in, in addressing some of these uh, issues? I think focusing on the obesity and the portion sizes is the big area. The food quality here is good. You don't have processed foods. You don't have McDonald's or Kentucky Fried, thank goodness. Um, and all your food is fresh. No, not processed, no packaging, so you've got some real good pluses. There is vegetables there if people are willing to grow them and pick them. And I think the big problem is the consumption of very high carbohydrate starchy foods. And that is the, what's contributing to the obesity problem. And the obesity is reflecting through with the diabetes, high blood pressure, gout, and all those other non-communicable diseases. It is also expected that a report of recommendations will be presented to the health department, but the main message is for people to be mindful of portion sizes and obesity. Tahiono Art Gallery was buzzing with excitement, showcasing contemporary Hiapo-inspired drawings by Corin Cross. The opening preview exhibition held yesterday afternoon attracted locals and visitors alike, marvelling over these unique hidden gems. Artist Karen Cross was humbled by the interest shown and keen to share her artwork that she says is inspired by life. And this is also reflected in the vibrant, colourful creations with a tint of Pacific flavour and youthful flair. Yeah, I love the, uh, the natural fibre and, um, and yeah, it is traditional, although we don't really um, do it much here in the US. The response has been good, actually. Um, I, I don't know that there's a lot of uh, hiapo being used in the at the moment. Um, I know that there are one or two artists that do use it, but, um, but because they don't uh, make it here, um, you know, when people do see it, it's kind of like, um, oh, awesome, <laughs> you know? Because, yeah. But there are one or two paper. Paper. I think that's what makes it contemporary, you know. It's, um, I love colour and I don't think that um, just because it's, um, I, I think that just because it, it's hiapo that you, that you, you know, you shouldn't be able to use colour. I think that, um, I think that colour makes it vibrant and, and contemporary. Yeah. If there are some young people out there who are probably interested in getting into this kind of thing, uh, exhibiting some of the work, what, what kind of advice would you give to them? Um, do it. You know, it's as simple as that. If you've got the time and you've got the passion, then do it. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I work at a desk in New Zealand. I, you know, if I could do it more than I probably would, but yeah, if you have the drive, then I say do it. I mean. Um, for all the young people, yeah, absolutely.
one last thing. Uh, in terms of your artwork, what, what is your inspiration? Life, you know? Um, experiences. Um, um, yeah, just moving and, you know, just life. That's it. I'm pretty sure that's all you need for inspiration, you know? Things you've, things you've experienced and, yeah. Karen says that some of these art pieces were initially sent up for the arts festival in April, but with the boat delay, that meant that was not possible. But the timing, she says, is ideal, considering she is on the island on a short break. The Hiapu James exhibition is open for another week, but it's best to get in early as these gems are quickly being snapped up. Those are our news stories that we have for you this evening. We do hope that you have an enjoyable weekend and join us again for our next news bulletin next week.